Well, great to see you, Ken. Who better to discuss if the American dream is alive and well than Ken Lingone, the co-founder of Home Depot, the chairman of Invamed Associates. Ken is the grandson of Italian immigrants. He grew up on Long Island and he comes from humble beginnings. As a kid, he worked various jobs from a caddy to a ditch digger. His parents worked hard to send him to college at Bucknell University where he studied economics. And after Bucknell, he did two years in the US Army. He then made a name for himself on Wall Street. 50 years ago this month, when he was 33 years old, he took Ross Perot's electronic data systems public, his first IPO. And Ken and his wife are well-known philanthropists, especially here in New York City at NYU Langone Medical. He is the author of the best-selling book, I Love Capitalism. Ken, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, Ken, we do have to talk about your book since you are this author of this book that's a bestseller now. So I have a very important question for you. Go ahead. All right, so last month, a recent Gallup poll uh, came out that showed that more young people are holding a positive view of socialism and their views of capitalism are at a decade low. So what is your reaction to that? I think it's natural that, that this group, their first taste or their first knowledge of capitalism was the collapse in 2008. They were eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. So capitalism did not present itself very well, but that wasn't capitalism. That was a system that's gone amok, one amok. And you know, there's an old saying, there's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, I think the financial regulation thing was Dodd-Frank. That was a big guy that was going to clean the mess up. I would remind you that Barney Frank, about nine years before that, was saying it was an inherent American right for everybody to own a home. And it was that mentality, I'm not suggesting he did it all by himself, but it was that mentality that allowed the insanity to spread. So as I said, and you know, give Wall Street credit for one thing. If you give them an opening on how to make money, they'll take advantage of it. That's, that's the way the system works, sometimes for the good, sometimes not. So I understand their bias based on that period of time, but uh, I would argue to any of them, I'll, Put you in my plane, I'll fly you down to Venezuela, and let's see how good socialism's doing down there, or Cuba, or any place you want to name it. Capitalism is like anything else in life. Too much of anything is no good. I think we need to be conscious of our obligations and our responsibilities, but the one statistic that matters to me more than anything else relative to the Home Depot Entry-level job at the Home Depot is pushing carts in in the parking lot and helping customers load their cars up, hopefully, with enormous amounts of merchandise. We have 3,000. They started out as 18, barely out of high school. Weren't going to college. We have 3,000 of them. They're multimillionaires today. And if you want a testimony to capitalism, Talk to any one of those 3,000 people. Well, Ken, when you do have conversations, I'm, I'm taking it you visited some of these young folks and you have talked about mm -hmm. your book. Um, mm -hmm. What are you hearing from them, though? I know you have this message of capitalism, but what are you hearing? Like, what are their frustrations? Thank God that generation has a great sensitivity for other people. And that's good. The, the hurt and pain that's out there we all should be doing something about. And I commend them for that. But I urge you, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'll only give you a benchmark. If you took every single nickel I've spent, or my wife and I have spent, which really adds a number up when you include her, okay? Because <laughs> uh, she's a spender, not a shopper, all right? God bless her. She's been with me the whole run, and it's been a hell of a run. But if you add up all the money we've spent on ourselves, homes, <clears throat> vacations, cars, you name it, it's a fraction of the money we've given away to great causes. 
So I, I make no apology for living well. <clears throat> I make no apology whatsoever for having a beautiful airplane that takes me wherever I want to go, or beautiful homes, none of that. I can say in all good conscience that I've given away more than I've spent on myself or my wife and I have spent on our family. Okay? And maybe that's a rationalization, but I think it's a pretty good yardstick. And I make no apology for that. Go to every college and university in America today. Look at the buildings that have names on them. Go to the medical centers all over here, the city. Go to libraries. Go to museums. All those places exist because people saw fit to share their good fortune with others. And I don't think anybody should apologize for being successful. And in that respect, by the way, I have no right to tell somebody else what to do with their money. The fact that my wife and I strongly feel that we have a moral obligation doesn't mean that's the same moral obligation, moral obligation for somebody else. It's for them to decide what they want. But I can assure you, there's no nation on this earth that's more philanthropic than this nation. And the proof is, go to every mecca of medicine in this city, Mount Sinai, Cornell, Columbia, NYU, you name it, and go in and look at these different programs and these buildings and these endowments and these chairs in surgery and chairs in oncology. It's all because somebody said, I want to do it. Right. Well, you and your wife donated $100 million recently to NYU to fund tuition, so there'll be free tuition right. for med school students going forward. Why, why did you do that? Well, I suppose you start by saying, how can I touch the most peace pop people possible? In 12 short years, I still expect to be alive, even though I'm 83. I'm counting on it, all right? In 12 short years, this nation is going to be short 50,000 primary care physicians, 30,000 pediatricians, and about 25,000 OBGYN. And if we don't figure a way out to offer a kid, by the way, a pediatrician, 150, 175,000 bucks a year. I know many firms on Wall Street that pay secretaries more than that, or pay guys that run their dining rooms more than that. So you're asking a young person, boy or girl, whatever, to sign up for $200,000 average when they're done with medical school. And where you have this need, there isn't much money. Uh, we had this ceremony announcing this, and by the way, I was a fraction of the money that was necessary to make that happen. We raised $500 million, and I only gave 100, there was 400 million from other people. All private donors, nothing to do with the government. And after the ceremony, a mother came up to me. She's a pediatrician, and she graduated 35 years before, ago. And she's still paying off her medical school debt. And her young son wanted to be a doctor from the time he was five or six years old. And she made her mind up that whatever it took, she was going to help him go to medical school. Now, until that morning, she said she was prepared to die in debt because while she'd pay her medical school debt off shortly, she was adding the medical debt of her son to that amount. And she said to me, now, she said, I know when I die, I'm not going to be in debt. And the better part of that is not what it did for her, but what it does for society. We have these great needs, and, and I, I lecture our guys at the medical center. I never want to hear you say to some other medical center, follow us, join us, join us. We've got a serious national problem, and we're living longer. Understand something. With all this great science and all this great medical breakthroughs we're having, we're living a hell of a lot longer and more vibrant and more active. And guess what? The longer you live, the more health care you need. That's why, for example, Obamacare is a disaster, because they were excluding the 22 and 23 and 24-year-old kids where they make the money actuarially to compensate for the money you lose, 
on the guys my age who are in a hospital or, or in a doctor's office probably every six or eight weeks. Math doesn't work. So why we did it was we decided that this was one way uh, that we could demonstrate our gratitude, our way of living the American dream. And I've lived the American dream. My father went to the eighth grade. My mother went to the seventh grade. My father was a plumber. My mother worked in the school cafeteria. And here I am. And how did that happen? It happened because my grandparents had the wisdom to come to this country for a better opportunity. Not for them. My grandfather died the way he started in life. At six years old, he started out with a shovel in his hand. And he left school when he was six years old in Europe, Italy. And he came over here and he died with a shovel in his hand at 72. But he sacrificed what he did so I would have a better life. And, and we feel very, my wife and I feel very strongly that, thank you very much. That, and, and let me assure you of one thing, and, and I'm speaking to a lot of young people here, and I, my guess is there's a pretty good chance a lot of you aren't of the same side of the political, political spectrum as I am. That's okay. I can live with that. But let me assure you of one thing. There's no nation on this earth like this nation. The issue of immigration is such a hot button in America today for one reason. Everybody wants to come here. My grandfather came here when he was 21, and he was married and had two children. He left his wife and two children and came here, lived in a room with 11 other men on Mulberry Street for two years to save enough money to send for his wife and his two children. And during World War II, when we all used to go to Grandma's on Sunday for Sunday lunch, and I had uncles and cousins that were in the war, the kids, I was eight, nine years old, We'd lie on the ground and we'd write notes, letters to our cousins and uncles that were in the war. And one Sunday, I was, the way it worked is we all ate. The woman went in the kitchen and cleaned up. The men went in the living room and fell asleep. And the children were on the floor on linoleum. We didn't have carpet and then linoleum writing letters to the uncles and cousins that were all fighting the war. And I asked my grandfather, who could not speak an interesting thing. He couldn't speak English, but he absolutely insisted that his children only speak English to his grandchildren. Because he said, I came here, I wanted to be part of this country. And by the way, the proudest day of his life was the Memorial Day parade every year in Port Washington, where the Sons of Italy had a group in the parade and he, putting on his Sons of Italy hat with a, with a badge was one of the most precious days of his life. So I asked my mom back to the floor. I said, Mom, ask Grandpa if he's ever been back to Italy. And, and by the way, I love Italy. I love going there. But I love this place more. I'm an American of Italian extraction. I'm not an Italian-American, OK? So you either declare yourself as an American, acknowledging where it all started. That's fair. But this hyphenated stuff, in my opinion, has no bearing whatsoever. I'm a proud American, and my grandfather, more importantly, was a proud adopted American. But anyway, so I said, Mom, has Grandpa ever been back to Italy? So she asked him in Italian, because he couldn't speak English. And he said, no, he hadn't been back to Italy. And I said, well, ask him why he didn't go back. And his answer was, there was nothing there for me. That's why I left. Why would I go back? Now think about that. And I think the sooner we recognize what a precious thing we have in this country, this country itself, and stop beating the hell out of it, stop. These, these politicians, all of them, of all, all hues and shapes and colors, cut it out. We were, we are, and we will always be the greatest nation on earth. And frankly, if you don't believe that, go where you want to go, but get the hell out of here. No, I'm very serious. I'm very serious about that. If you don't think there's something special and unique about this country, beat it. Beat it. For the governor of the state of New York to say we were never a great nation, then why did we all come here? We are a nation of immigrants. Why did we come here? 
The only guys that can say they're not are the American Indians. But the rest of us are off from someplace else, one or two or three or four generations before that. And we ought to be proud of that. And we, so how do I feel about philanthropy? First of all, I, I'm not giving a thing up. My father taught me this. That if you give something to somebody and you don't give anything up, that's not philanthropy. Philanthropy is only when you sacrifice something to do something for somebody else. Well, I'm, I, I haven't gotten there yet, and I don't think I'm ever going to get there, so I guess I'm never going to be a pure philanthropist. But, but we've got a very precious thing in this country. Among other things, we have the right to disagree, and we have the right to argue, and we have the right to pick it. We have the right to do all these things. And again, I say to you, it's interesting. Everybody wants to come here. We wouldn't have an immigration problem if that wasn't the case. So that's my notion on philanthropy. And, and, Go ahead. And can you're, you've said that you're a supporter of President Trump. You like some of the I'm economic... a supporter of what he does. Okay. I, I, think, I think he's accomplished more in two years than the last five idiots in the last 30 years. <laughs> so <laughs> you like what he does? You Korea, like Korea, Korea. A year ago, Rocket Man was going to be annihilated. Right? That's what he said. And by the way, I had a very high highly respected American diplomat say he handled him right. We got three people back they wouldn't let go. And there's been no rockets in the space for the last eight, nine, ten months. I don't know what you call it. I call it a better situation than it was before. The issue on tariffs, game, set, match, fellas. When the rest of the world, pardon me, was on its ass, we had a moral obligation to help them get on their feet. China today is the second largest economy in the world. They ought to be on an equal footing with us, and we should be on an equal footing with them. Germany, after World War, you know, we learned something. After World War I, largely because of French insistence, we stripped Germany of its industrial capacity, which triggered eventually a horrible period of inflation, which triggered pain and suffering, which led to the ascendancy of Hitler through a democratic process. We should never forget that. The second time, we said, we're not doing that. So we had the Marshall Plan. We had, oh, think of all the Truman Doctrine. All the things we did, we rebuilt, we helped rebuild, we didn't do it. We helped rebuild Japan. We helped rebuild Germany. We helped rebuild Europe. We did it, and we're good for it. But now, guess what? <laughs> you pay your own way. And I think we have been made monkeys, we, I'm talking about our political leaders, over the years, sure, China wants to keep things the way they are. Germany wants to keep things the way they are. I know something right now. If I'm in a deal with you, I'm not happy the way it is. <laughs> that means I'm either got as good a deal or I've got a better deal. So all of a sudden, this guy shows up and says, hey, guys, something's wrong. We only charge you 2.5% for bringing all your cars into America, and that's about six or 700,000. Go look at the BMWs and the Mercedes and the Audis and the, and the Porsches and you name it, all over New York City or go all over America. They don't buy our cars over there for one reason. They burn up too much gas and they're too big. So we sell pittance. Here was an opportunity for Germany to be statesmanlike by saying, you know what? We're going to lower the tariff on your cause to what you're charging us on our cause. It's a win for them because the numbers are lopsided. Do I wish Trump, Trump did things differently than the way he does? Yes, but give him credit. He's behaving exactly the way he behaved when he was running for the presidency. He got elected. <clears throat> So maybe my way is wrong and maybe his way is right. I'm not saying, but I would say to you, uh, I'd like it better if he took a few less victory laps, but I ain't going to challenge him. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to challenge him because he's getting the results. And w whether you like it or not, he's got something to do with the prosperity we're experiencing right now, big time. 
Well, Ken, specifically though on tariffs, especially since you're invested in Home Depot, how do you look at that, the impact of the recent round that he has announced for 200 billion, a 10% tariff there, and then eventually raise it to 25%? Okay. Life insurance works, believe it or not, because most people don't commit suicide. You think about it, if you sold life insurance, and right after the guy bought the policy, he jumped out a window, and everybody did the same thing. Life insurance company's going broke. People will tend to do what's in their selfish interest that's right for them. It's in our interest and our trading partner's interest that we not have tariffs. That said, for years and years and years and years and years, our political leaders have had their pants taken off by our trading partners. So you got two choices. You start a war. We've had wars in the past because of trading issues. Or you do what this guy's doing. But it isn't going to be the status quo. That's over. People forget, by the way, 50 years ago, last Wednesday, the 12th, was the date that I took EDS public. That's right. And I went down, my wife and I had a dinner party in Dallas commemorating the 50th anniversary. We had Ross Perot and his wife and all of his key guys. Thank God they're all alive and their wives. We had a nice event last week. People forget, Ross Perot ran for president in 1992. And he was talking about, remember, the giant sucking sound from down south? Same thing Trump's talking about. Different color, but same thing. And the other thing Perot talked about, Trump's talking about draining the swamp, and Perot talked about cleaning out the barn. Same thing. Up, same thing. We desperately need to fix leadership in this country. And, I'll, and I will say this to you. I think one of the greatest payoffs of Trump's election is hopefully motivating other people, other than career politicians, to run for higher office. You mean, you mean other CEOs then? Uh, other CEOs, a doctor, I don't care who, who a lawyer, thinking, Ken, but, people, but people that don't start running for dog catcher in some little town, and fast forward 15 years, he's now president of the United States, and he's having his pants taken off by some guy from Germany or China or wherever the hell he is in a trade negotiation. Okay? This is what's happening in this country. Like it or not, like it or not, we start with our hands behind our backs because we want to be loved. We're diplomats. This is the change that's going on in the world today. We're dealing with people that are tough. We're dealing with people that have no sense of responsibility in making a very great deal for themselves and screwing us. And Trump said it when he said, I don't blame those countries. I blame our guys for giving the store away. And we did. But there was a different time. But when it all happened, it happened when the world was on its ass and we needed a help. And we did help. That's the, that's the kindness and goodness of this country. That's part of its greatness. But that's over. Germany is powerful. Germany is Germany's carrying Europe right now by itself, by its own desire. China, 30 years ago, was nothing. In the next 10 years, China will definitely be the largest economy in the world. Just the numbers, they're going to work. That's going to happen. They don't need handouts anymore. And we don't need to be sugar daddy. We need fair. We need, for example, with China, we've got to fix intellectual property. This is nuts. Somebody invents something here. And we spend a fortune, well, however it happened, and they steal it over there and they don't pay you anything for it because that's part of the game. So how do I feel about Trump? Uh, he, he, <laughs> he, he's different. He's different. But if you, don't, if you don't think he deserves a lot of credit, maybe not all of it, but a lot of credit for the prosperity we're all experiencing right now. That's, a great, that's the greatest economic expansion we've had probably in 50 years. In fact, this morning's numbers were the lowest they were since 1969. That's 49 years ago. 
Well, let me ask you this. Although Obama said he's the guy that did it. Meanwhile, he had his foot on the throat of business for eight years. See, the biggest thing I think Trump's doing is deregulation. Because a lot of these regulations were nonsense. They did nothing for anybody. Go ahead. All right, so let me ask you this. You're yep. someone who always says that you really value kind word. You're someone who's known for mm -hmm. doing kind gestures. Mm -hmm. You really like that. So I you can make the argument. Exactly what I that said was the three most powerful things in life are a kind word, a thoughtful gesture, and passion and enthusiasm for whatever you're doing. Right. So you can make the argument that the President of the United States is effectively the CEO of the country. <clears throat> He's got the business side down, the economy he is. strong. But at the same time, how do you reconcile some of the culture that he's creating, some of the divisiveness that we we're hearing? Um... Did you see all that kumbaya with John uh, McCain's funeral? We got to come together, and you know where this guy's dividing us. I don't think Trump was any place near the hearings on Kavanaugh. What's happened there is disgusting. And you talk about divisiveness, blame Trump if you want, but this is, go back to Newt Gingrich in 1992. There's a, there was a, Stan Druckenmiller and I ran a big ad when they were all talking about shutting the government as a train wreck. And there's a big picture of Stanley and me with, with Bob Dole and Newt Gingrich. We ran an ad, the two of us. What about a train wreck? And guess what? If you shut the government for a while, you'd probably be better off because it'd be less money pissed away, pardon my French. <laughs> but he is not the reason. We've been divided for a long, long time. And if you want to pick an inflection point, I would say the Vietnamese War. That was when we really began to get divided because we were involved. And by the way, I was wrong. I was 100% wrong. I thought it was a worthwhile war. It was not. It was a horrible war. It was a huge mistake. And it divided this country like nothing ever before. And by the way, in the spirit of open candor, my son's wife, who I love as if she's my daughter, is from Vietnam. And her mother comes over. The Vietnamese people wanted to have a love affair with America in the worst way. They wanted to be our friends, and they are our friends now. That's when it all started. So don't blame Trump for the divisiveness that's gone on. You look at what's gone on here. I can go right down the list, not just with the confirmation hearing of, of Kavanaugh, but everything we're doing. Entitlements. You don't, the insanity, ICE. You don't want ice? Okay. So now you got nobody stopping to ask somebody coming in, is this what you want? Maybe this is what you want. Oh, you can't come in because you haven't got the documentation or the papers. No, do away with that. There's nobody there. Get off the plane. Come on in. Do what you want. Live it up. Have fun. Do we want borders? If we don't want borders, then we don't need ice. Do you like the idea that there's police wandering around New York City that, God forbid, if you have a problem? Maybe you don't want police either. That's your call. Think of the increase in car accidents and deaths on the road if you didn't have speed limits. And how good are speed limits if you don't have enforcement of those speed limits? This is nuts. Doctors, would you like some guy to show up one day and say, hey, I'm a doctor, didn't go to medical school, didn't pass a test, didn't get a license? Yeah, I'm a doctor. Come on in, I want to do a brain operation on you. <laughs> Is that what you, why do you have, why do you have that? It's a form of enforcement because that's what you want to, for your own security. Do away with the FDA. Hey, I got a new drug here, thalidomide. Hey, take it all you want, enjoy yourself. <laughs> Is that what you want? I mean, this is nuts. We've been divided for too long. Frankly, I think, to me, there's an old expression, you won't get a drunk to stop drinking until they hit bottom. <clears throat> Trump, to me, is the fever. He's not the disease. The disease is the anger and frustration of the American people with their government and the leadership in that government. And I think Trump, like it or not, this is the consequence of the disgust of the American people with what's gone on in Washington for too long. And don't kid yourselves. That 35% he's got is as solid as the granite that Manhattan stands on. 2020, he's got to get 15% of the votes, and he's in. Go look and see. Watch him with these rallies he goes around to. 
you know, and the more absurd things he says, the bigger the crowds get. <laughs> okay, so what, all right, I answer that question? Yes, uh, well, Ken Langone, it is always a pleasure having you, and you hearing from you. And it's lunchtime now, and we're gonna go to our studio I, I for wanna, midday may I, may I, I just wanna say one yes, thing. Yes, you can give one more I, piece I of advice. This, I, not advice. I meant what I said about this country. There will never be anything like it ever again on this earth. It is without question the finest experiment of mankind ever in the history of mankind. We have a lot of problems. We've got a lot of things we do bad. We've got a lot of mistakes we've got to fix. But take it all into account. I want to be here because this is where it is. And don't forget that. We are, we were, and we always will be the greatest country on earth. And if you don't believe that, maybe give it a shot. Some, go, go to Venezuela. There's some great opportunities down there. All right. Well, on that okay. note, Ken Lingon, thank you so much.